Institutions. It's been a journey for the last three years for us, and I'll kind of walk you guys through what we've done. Um, here is me, my contact information. If you would like to get a hold of me afterwards, my primary role in this is helping us become a culture city venue and being a liaison to our coffee shop. And I'll introduce you a couple of people that were essential as well. Um, a little bit about me I'm from the Midwest, I've been in Park City and Utah for the last five years. Um, before joining public libraries. I was in um, prison library work at home. I um, am an old woman at heart. I do gardening and do my fill-ins every night and antique on the weekends. Um, and we'll get started. But before that, I would like to personally, personally acknowledge that the Park City Library is on traditional land and seized territory of the Eastern Shoshone and Ute people who have stewarded this land through the generations. And we'll go to um, who is essential in our work at the library with neurodiverse patrons. We have Kate Mapp. She is our adult services librarian um, here at the library. She is lead on our next chapter book club and helps us do the Culture City venue onboarding. Sheree Ash, she's in our human resources for the city and is a key player with our neurodiversity employment initiative. And then we have Taylor and Katie. These are two wonderful gals that are owners of our coffee shop in our library. So we'll be referring to them throughout the presentation. Uh, first, just a little bit about what neurodiversity uh, is. Judy Singer, she is who coined the term sociologist who has autism. So in the late 90s, she really wanted to make sure people didn't call certain developmental disorders, neurological disorders. This is just a normal variation in someone's brain. They have certain strengths um, that other people do not have either. So we really want to make sure that it's something that's celebrated and not called um, a disorder. And that includes a variety of um, different things like ADHD, autism, dyslexia. Um, it really could go uh, uh, be a really long list. So these are just some examples. And then when we talk about neurodiversity now in the library, we are trying to redefine accessibility. So we like the statistic that one in five people learn and think differently, and that's a lot. And how do we think about these people using our library who think differently and the services we provide, we are now more leaning towards getting creative in that. Um, before we kind of were like leaning at the compliance of standards, are we, are we compliant to ADA, all these things, right? But now we're leaning towards moving to improving inclusivity and doing more than just what we are um, compelled to do, but what we really need to do. And before we kind of just were like, are we accessible? Um, but now we want to say, are we really usable? Somebody who is neurodiverse could come into our library at any time, but are they able to really use the library in our services? So this is Lucky One's Coffee. They're in the entryway of our library. They've been around for, let's see, I think they celebrated just over three years. That's CJ there. And when we were, we always strive to be the Park City's community living room. And when we were remodeled in 2015, when there was community visioning events, including a coffee shop was one of the main thing that the community wanted. And we had, did have a coffee shop before in the library but, um, when we did reopen after the remodel, but we have lucky ones now. And what really their niche is, is that they radiate this inclusivity and positivity. Um, our entry hall is not just a coffee shop, but a place that people um, have casual meetings and are studying and us partnering with lucky ones is a natural relationship that brings the public into both of our missions and how do they um, work with neurodiversity is that they are really mission based business so 70% of individuals with disabilities are unemployed most of their employees are also neurodiverse so lucky ones saw the opportunity to change the statistic with their business model so everybody that they hire in their um, business is either disabled, neurodiverse, et cetera. 
And they always get to see say that we experience every day the passion and love that these individuals have, and it's their vision to share that experience with the public. And uh, Taylor and Katie, this is a job that they are a, a coffee shop that they just decided to open, and they both had backgrounds with adaptive um, recreation, and they wanted to make a change in Park City, and we were very happy to have them here in the library. Uh, next is we're um, having next chapter book club. Here is Kate Mapp, our adult services librarian. I hope you can see my little blue circle here. And then this is Gerd here over on the right. She is a board member with the Friends of the Library and helps um, with the book club as well. So we are the Park City chapter of the Next Chapter Book Club. What can you do in your library to better serve neurodiverse patrons? They are looking to always open new chapters. And this is in partnership with Next Chapter and the Utah Disability Council. We have funding for this from our library's natural programming line and also the Friends of the Library really like to support this. And from their website, I just took this off so we can get some clear wording for you is that they offer a unique community-based book club for adolescents and adults. Ours focuses a lot more on the adult side. Um, and then um, especially people with Down syndrome, autism, cerebral palsy, and other intellectual and developmental disabilities. And the interesting thing about the book club is for people who can read and those who cannot either. So it's really inclusive that way to really enjoy um, the book and the story. And one of our personal successes is that Kate had a member who attended but never showed his face. He actually wore a hoodie and put his head on the table and you couldn't, didn't really want you to see him. And then one day he just decided to participate in the discussion and actually read part of the book. They read the book out loud um, when they meet. And it was a way for them to see that he really became comfortable and invested in the group. So it was... Um, a really big success for the book club. Here are some of the books that they've completed. Members of the book club take turns reading out loud between like one sentence, one sentence to a few pages to a chapter. It really depends on what um, everybody's comfortable with. They were really into um, um, Roald Dahl for a while. They really liked um, these graphic novels. They're doing Spiderwick right now. And then one thing that they really do is party often. So the end of each book, they celebrate that they finished a book. So here they're having a little pizza party on our patio. If they read a book that was turned into a movie, they watch the movie in our auditorium and have a personal screening of it. Or they were really interested in VR, so they had a personal VR party. And so they have a, a lot of fun and we are really glad that um, we have this book club here. And then the next part is our neurodiversity employment initiative that um, HR takes a lead in and then each department has um, an employee. So a little bit of background, Park City City Council created critical priorities as part of their visioning. And they say, if we don't get these right, it's gonna have a negative impact on our community. So they found these four things, transportation, energy, building initiatives and social equity. And here's just something that they say is that we need to recognize our community and strive for it in um, equitable space um, um, and services and justice and social well-being for all. And that kind of brought to a, a council member have, being really passionate about a community group called Bridge 21 that focuses on um, independent living for people with um, who are neurodiverse or disabled. And she saw that there were people in the community who really had a desire to work and have work as part of something in their life that they didn't have. And so the city council was able to suggest that we put an initiative in place to hire neurodiverse people. And through the budgeting process, we were able to, the city was able to get this approved and have a personnel line overseen by HR with personnel managed by the department that they worked in. 
And for hiring, the positions are created for the individual's talents and also part of the department's need that um, we need help with as well. So we have one part-time library assistant um, and they work in our check-in position, our floater position. Those are our customer service positions that are not necessarily um, public facing at all times. This position, um, kind of went to becoming our gaming expert for our Xbox, our PS4, and our Wii. This person was is really smart, can get this going when we all struggle. So they're always on call um, to help with gaming. They pull holds, shelf, um, they do searching for book lists, and then develop um, book lists for social media and help create blog posts and other special projects. An area that we are coaching this individual in um, is answering the phones and customer service points. So as the, um, the position has been, they've been in the position for longer, the co comfortability of expanding um, work interest has been um, opening a little bit to be a little bit more public facing, which we are, are very proud that they are more comfortable here at, at work. We've had to do a lot of self, um, self and staff development. Um, so when I was approached to have a neurodiverse candidate work in our department, what do librarians do first? Like I, I wanted to make sure I was the best manager I could be to somebody who needed something a little bit more personalized. So HR provided a few training sessions throughout the first year for the departments who had a neurodiverse candidate. Um, new staff, so the part-time person was asked how to succeed. And we found that having a personalized schedule, written instructions and one-on-one -on -one check ins were really essential. And then we also wanted to really provide staff development. So on our yearly staff development day, we had optimizing autism, come and discuss how to best serve neurodiverse patrons, which led to staff having a really great discussion on a variety of situations that they had experienced where they weren't quite sure if they wanted to do the right thing or if they did the right thing. Um, our customer service standard is super high. So they just really, really wanted to know um, the best way to help our patrons. And this was our trainer, um, Elliot Francis. He, so he's the founder and an uh, managing autist of the autis optimizing autism. I really uh, um, strongly recommend him for any trainings you might be interested in. And of course, the Utah Developmental Disabilities Council. And then a couple of thoughts from HR, um, as they've been doing this for maybe two and a half years now. And so there's definitely some learning lessons. Um, they really express that having the personal desire to hold a job versus a parental coaching to try to get someone to um, have a job was really um, something that they wanted to see is that the desire to have that. And then, to create a position, it was kind of having like, should we put somebody in a position based on their need or the department's need and try to find that fit? And it's kind of been like a half and half. Half of the position is created for that person's strengths and then half of it for what we need help with. And that's kind of been um, the more personalization that's really needed for the individual's success at work. And we want the program, to, the HR wants the program to expand, but at the same time, struggle to find managerial time. Their biggest successes in their employment initiative has been at the library and at the city's Ram gym, which is called the Mark, at their daycare services. And I think that the reason for that success is that we, we have really big buildings compared to some of the other departments, that there's always something to do, something we need to improve on, that um, having an individual come in um, through this initiative is really easy for us. And then the HR also wanted to mention that how can we tailor a need for someone that has a range of talents and set them up to success. So again, the need to be more per, um, personalized. And then um, just parental involvement. We want to foster a relationship with the employee, um, not the parents, and that that is more essential for success. Um, and um, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just... I think that's good for there. And then we're gonna hop on to Culture City. Um, we're really excited for this initiative at the library. It's something that we are still in the onboarding process of. 
So why be certified as an inclusive venue? So what Culture City does is that it wants to cater to everyone with sensory needs, not just autism. So that includes PTSD, dementia, Parkinson's, stroke patients. So it's a really wide variety of to be an inclusive venue. It, they also have a component where they train staff on how to help people with sensory needs. Um, and then we have simple yet really impactful modifications made to the location, so like our library, that this location will always be sensory inclusive. So it used to be like, here's our sensory inclusive day and a time. So every third Tuesday from three to four, we're really trying to get away from that, that we're sensory inclusive all of our operating hours. Um, and then how do we do that? Uh, oh, but first, where are they in, in Utah already? So um, Children's Museum seem like a really natural fit. Um, there's some up um, north and then the Vivid Smart Home Arena was just getting certified when COVID hit. So they're not um, officially on the map yet, but they're working on it. And then they've also worked with first responders in um, Salt Lake City. So here's what we put in our library. We have quiet areas um, signify are labeled with this sign. So we have a reading room, which is our only quiet room, no phones or anything like that. Um, there we have a space in a side entryway with the most comfortable seating there. So there could be a quiet area there. And then we have a reading garden outside that isn't a high volume, high traffic place. So there's a quiet area. So if somebody needs a place that um, doesn't have the brightest lights, a lot of people, not a lot of sound, they're able to find that area. And then we have our headphone zone. So that's like our story time room, our kids area, our auditorium, the coffee shop is quite loud, will help people know that if they use a noise canceling headphones to put their headphones on. And then at our front desk, we have signs that say that our sensory bags are available and that they can be used, be used at any time. So what's in those are really nice head uh, sound canceling headphones, marble fidgets, noodle fidgets, tangle fidgets, and they're specifically not called um, like sensory toys. It's for people of all ages. And it's supposed we want that to be very, very clear um, that is not just a children's program. And then they have an ID badge that can be um, worn if they choose to, that just alerts our staff that they are a Culture City VIP and that they might need um, some uh, different approach to customer service. We also have at the desk available is um, some communication tools and a weighted blanket that's meant more for a story time. Um, that is also a whiteboard erasable, not really a whiteboard, but like a writable cloth that's on it. Um, and we have that out And our next step to be a certified venue is to be put on the Culture City app. So that's when somebody is coming to our our venue that they can look at the app, they can see what the library looks like, they can kind of get a game plan of where the quiet areas are, where the headphone areas might be, um, so that they can have a the most successful experience um, that they can have at our venue. And sorry, I blew through that really fast. So if you guys have any questions, um, I'd be happy to chat about anything um, about it. Looks like we have a comment. Oh, that's from Rita. Um, oh yes, please sign up for some year of learning um, that's coming up as well. Okay then, well, thanks for joining us. And oh, noodle fidgets, Daniel, let me share my screen again and I'll show you. Here are these noodle fidgets. So they're like a, think of it as like a malleable licorice kind of thing. And you can twist them um, um, and take them apart. So this marble fidget has like the marble in it where you can push it back and forth. Um, and these are just more malleable, two, two separate things that you can put back um, and forth together. 
Um, can Yes, you can email me if you have any questions. Here's my email. And we have a lot of people who um, really help us with getting to be successful at serving neurodiverse patrons. So if you have any questions, send them to me. I'll get you to the right person. How do you measure success in these programs? So the next chapter book club, that's really measured by personal success and the group's interest. We have a core group of about eight to 10 people that come. And um, it's really, I think Kate kind of gauges the interest level and definitely the comfortability level being there. Um, so like the individual who didn't really want to show his face, people who have um, stutters or not comfortable reading, they have become more comfortable with the group and feel really open and inclusive there. So I think that's definitely a measure of success um, for the, um, employment initiative. We've seen um, the individual who works in the library become a lot more comfortable um, and just engaging with our staff. Um, they're interested in becoming more public facing at work. So that to me is a lot of success for that individual. Um, the, for example, the idea of answering the phone almost caused like a, a complete panic attack. And now that we, when we talk about if the idea of training to be used on the phone, to be using phones is a lot more like we're not there yet, but the idea of it is coming more comfortable. Um, let's see. Can you show the last two slides or can we give them as a handout? Um, let's see. The, the two slides here is this one here and here. This I just grabbed off of Culture City's website and they have everything in it. Um, if you wanna put in your email, I can, I can email it to you right now if you like. What are the specific things you are doing in the children's area for neurodiverse children? Um, I am, um, not in the children's department. So what they're really doing is we decided to label the whole children's department as a headphone zone and not just the story time room. There's also, when we did the remodel, oh geez, what should we call them? Like interactive, I would call it more of like a sensory interactive tool that's on the wall. So I, I like that. Um, we are becoming more, Neuro, neurodiverse sensitive or inclusive in the story time um, because of the weighted lap pads. And if somebody has like a, a certain request, we definitely consider that. How long is the meeting? The meeting is about an hour long before COVID. It was a lunch meeting. So it, part of it was reading the book, um, talking about the book, and then having lunch and having a social aspect. And that was really important to the members. So now they're not doing lunch. They're really looking forward to that. Um, again, it's about an hour. I'm sorry, it's about an hour long. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. And the pace of reading the book is really different. Um, we, they either go from like a chapter to two chapters. They're not in a rush to finish the books, but they do choose smaller books. They did try to do Harry Potter. That was way too long. It took too much time. Um, um, so now they do smaller ones. So like the Spiderwick Chronicles has been really great and they are reading all five. Um, someone says I have one young patron with mild autism who jumps in front of other patrons I'm helping. How can I help him? Um, I would say I'm not, I don't always work with children. Um, I would probably have a conversation with the parents about how you can help them. Um, and just, we, so part of, I think the sense and implementing a sensory bake would be great because they have something that they can fidget with if you are helping somebody um, else, um, if it's just disrupt, disrupt, disruptive, but 
also the wanting some attention. So I would probably try to engage them in something that they're interested in until you can give more attention at the desk or during um, help at the desk or during programs. Rita, do you mean that how can we help somebody who has autism at those places? Um, I think we really rely on the sensory, the sensory bags um, to really help. And then we, I did have in the last pre-COVID a patron who um, wasn't always verbal that had autism and um, had some behaviors that we kind of needed to help redirect. And we really tried, he didn't really want to communicate with me um, because I was kind of giving some rules, right? Rules and boundaries. So what we did was we had a conversation with the parents and then during school, that child came with their special ed teacher and we kind of did a, a tour, had a one-on-one -on -one conversation about interests and what's available. So we kind of try to cater that specifically to that patron and that, were, that really helped um, know that the library was a welcoming space and that what behaviors weren't welcomed and why. And that really helped us um, a lot. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you everyone. I hope you have a really great day with your conference and I can't wait to see you in May for the ULA conference. Thank you so much, Becca. This was really wonderful. What an inspiring program you guys have. You're welcome. Thanks it's everyone. Really Michelle, I'm gonna email you right now, honey, okay? All right, thank you everybody for coming to today's session. I hope you guys enjoy a slightly longer lunch now, which I think we all can appreciate. And we'll see you guys back at one o'clock for afternoon sessions. Have a great lunch, everybody.